today as we come to the table. When you talk about the way God designed us, let me just say this. When God designed your body, you know how long he designed it to live? Forever. If it wasn't for the decaying processes and the radiation processes and all that we now have in this world, God has created you fearfully and wonderfully. Your cells reproduce. You can actually reproduce enough to continue to live forever. But the reason that you can't now is because, again, sin is into the world and decay is into the world. God has removed this canopy as the earth was flooded in a worldwide flood, and now we have all the effects of that until the Lord comes back and restores it. And the Bible says when He restores it, we will once again live hundreds of years. And, of course, at that time, we'll have our new bodies, so we'll live eternally. Your body was designed with the mechanisms and regeneration ability to live forever. This might sound like a sci-fi alternate reality. And well, I guess right now it is. When sin entered the world, disease and death came with it. But God knew better than to leave us to our own devices forever. He had a plan. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message with Pastor Mark, you're going to see God's plan in all its fullness, from the first creation to the recreation of your body. When you go live with God, your body gets recreated in all its glorious perfection once again, and the sci-fi alternate reality becomes the reality. Just imagine eternal life. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter one, with today's edition of Come to the Table. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now note this. Again, we see this kind of moving theme here, this developing theme of the Lord being light himself. So when God said, let there be light, it's just like, Jesus. Whoa, I love it. Now he was already there, but I kind of look at it, the Bible says that his glory fills the universe. It fills the earth. And it's almost as if God said, let there be Jesus. I love it. And so, whoa, there he is. You can't get away from him. He's all around us. He's lighting our very existence, our very universe. And notice it says, the light came to all men. Yes, that means even those who claim to be atheist. You see, here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that all of us know that there's a God. The Bible says the atheist is a liar. It says that light has been revealed to all, that they know the truth, but what they've done is they said, I know that's truth, but I refuse it, I reject it, and I'm not going to listen to it. And what happens is it's not an intellectual problem, it is a spiritual problem, and it is a choice problem. And as long as that problem continues to go on, what happens? As the problem continues to go on, they become solidified. They become hardened in that viewpoint, and the Bible says their conscience is seared with a hot iron. And so now they can't believe. Again, I've shared the story with you before about the father talking to his son. And he's like, you know, these crazy Christians, they believe that God's real and all, yeah, dad. And they just waste all their time on religion, yeah, dad. And Sunday morning, they could be doing all kinds of things, fishing and doing, yeah, yeah. They believe in God, oh, yeah, yeah. And he got quiet for a minute. And the story says his son said, you know what, dad? He said, what, son? He said, do you think God knows we don't believe in him? Because the bottom line is, all of us know in our hearts that there's a God. We know that he's there. When you're arguing with somebody about whether or not God exists, guys, you don't have to argue about whether or not God exists. You need to pray for God to open their eyes spiritually because they know and they have known as a child at some point that God existed. They've hardened their heart. You can't, no child is born thinking no God exists. You have to teach a child that because God puts it in the very heart. The light is exposed to all men. It says in John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Well, now we can flip back to Genesis. So I hope you kept your marker there. I wanted you to see the word in relation to what God was doing as he spoke and as he created and Jesus being there and Jesus being that creative force and the one who did the creating himself. And notice it says there in verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So evening and the morning were the first day. And again, notice here God divided 
the light from the darkness. And, and let me note this. This is speaking in a very literal way, but God still does that today, doesn't he? In a spiritual way. God divides the light from darkness. What's my point? Well, my point is this, is that the saved or the spiritually enlightened are separate from those in a spiritual sense from the unsaved and those that are not spiritually enlightened. Your eyes have been opened. God has shined his light into your heart, and now the scriptures make sense. Now re the reality of eternity all makes sense. But for the unbeliever, although they see the light from the outside, it has not been allowed to penetrate. It has not been allowed to come into their heart and be a part of who they are. And so there's this division that takes place. That's why when we give our life to the Lord, we find suddenly that our old friendships suddenly change dramatically, don't we? You have some of the old friendships, and you give your life to the Lord and realize something's different here. It's just not the same as it used to be. Or maybe in your family, you get saved and they're not, and you get with your family, and it's like, what are we going to talk about? It's like we don't really have anything in common. Why? Well, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 15 says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? In other words, you can't marry the two. It's not that we're not to go among them and be a witness to them and love them. I'm not saying that. They must be reached, mustn't they? Right? What I'm saying is, is you're not going to have that common bond anymore. You know, light and darkness can't just call each other up and say, all right, hey, you know, go somewhere together. Sure, let's do it. We'll meet down here, whatever. And what would happen is, you see, darkness gets there first, right? Light shows up. Hey, where'd you go? Darkness, you know? So, you know, I mean, it just they can't be in the same place. Okay? They force each other out. And so again, we see God dividing here this light and this darkness. And notice again, it's interesting, at the end of verse 5, he says, an evening and morning was the first day. Notice he doesn't say morning and evening. He says evening and morning was the first day. Now, I don't know why God chose to do it that way, but it does give us insight into why the Hebrews today, when, when you look at the Hebrew day, the Jewish day, they don't judge it by morning and night like we do in America. They judge it by night to morning. The Hebrew day starts when the sun goes down. And then it's the next day when the light comes up. It's the last part of their day. And so again, it just gives you some insight into why the Hebrews do it. They do it based off of Genesis right here where God said after he created, his order was the evening and the morning, the first day. Now we come to day two. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now notice this here, this dividing of the waters from the waters, God takes all these waters he's created and he divides them now in two sections. Very interesting as you begin to think about this and try to visualize it in your mind. The word firmament here means an expanse. So what God has done is he took the waters here, he took part of those waters and lifted them up to the very upper atmosphere, if you will, and made this expanse between the two, the oceans on the earth and this if you will, water canopy that surrounded the earth that God lifted up that circled the entire earth. And it was this firmament, what we call this area where the planes fly and the birds fly. That's the firmament that he's talking about. We'll see in a moment, actually even called one of the heavens. But we'll get to that in a moment. But he took this canopy and divided the two between. Now, again, we need to note a couple things here. He's not simply talking about the clouds and their moisture because this layer of water is said to be above the firmament, not in the firmament. That's key. Because some might say, well, that just means the clouds and the moisture we have. No, no, no. He did something physically where he put a huge body of water above the earth. Now, again, we know that this space in between here, he's not talking about the clouds simply because the moisture is said to be above. But also in Genesis 2.5, it tells us there was not yet rain upon the earth until the flood, but the earth was watered with a mist. And this mist must have been only at the lower level since Genesis 9.13 tells us there were not rainbows until after the flood, which if there were moisture at higher altitudes, it would have been there. Now, here's the question. If God put this canopy that's up there, and note this, scientists now know today that if you took all the moisture around the earth that's in our globe, in our atmosphere, and let it all rain out, you would only get one inch worldwide. It would be spread evenly an inch worldwide, worldwide if you took all the moisture that's in our surrounding atmosphere. Now, why is that significant? Well, first of all, let me ask this question. Where is that canopy today? 
If God took this huge canopy and divided the waters from the waters and put them up there and, and put this huge canopy, where is it today? And why was it in Noah's day, when we get to Genesis 6, that it rained 40 days and 40 nights when scientists say you couldn't get but an inch of rain out of our current level of moisture that we have in our atmosphere? Why is that? Because this canopy that used to be there is no longer there. That's why you don't see it anymore. That's why you don't find it. Mark, when did the canopy disappear and what happened to this canopy? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7 that God not only released the fountains of the deep, but he opened up the windows of heaven and rained on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, flooding the entire earth. And so you see this canopy that God placed above the earth, he released it. When it came to the worldwide flood and this massive amount of water that was retained up in our atmosphere was released and flooded the entire earth. Now again, that answers the question, how could it rain? Because scientists say today, how could it rain 40 days and 40 nights straight? Oh, the, that couldn't have happened. Not now, but it could have happened when there was a worldwide canopy surrounding the earth, when God said he divided the waters from the waters and made this canopy. Now, again, we know that it would have been extremely thick because it would have had to have held enough water to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And it lasted, again, that entire time, flooded the entire earth. But again, this brings up a problem. Because how could it have been that thick? And, and what about the sunlight coming in? What about all these other things? No, don't you understand that if the waters were moved up to that level, they would be what is called a gaseous vapor. It would be just like when you see Saturn and these other planets that have rings around them or different types of gases. It's a vapor. And so you can hold, scientists know you can hold enormous amounts of water magnitude in the gaseous vapor form. And yet it's all see-through, which means it wouldn't, have impeded the view of, it wouldn't have impeded the view of the stars. It wouldn't have impeded the view of the sun. It wouldn't have slowed anything down. It would have simply been there and been protecting the earth in a number of, of ways. Now, why do I say protecting the earth? Because there's a lot of things that answer more questions biblically in light of understanding this water canopy that was surrounding the earth that God talks about here in Genesis chapter 1. What is that? Well, glad you asked. You ever wonder why people in the first part of the Bible lived hundreds of years and today we don't? Ever had that challenge your faith and think, wait a minute, how could people live hundreds of years? I'm not even going to make it to 100. I may not make it to 90 or 80 or 70. How did these people live all these years? What happened? Guys, scientists say that it can be explained if indeed there was a water canopy surrounding the earth. What do I mean by that? Well, so you're going to find when we get to Genesis 6, prior to Genesis 6 and the worldwide flood, mankind lived hundreds of years. After Genesis 6, there are still some that continue on in their hundreds of years, but it begins this rapid drop in, in the rate of lifespan. Rapid, immediately, almost like you draw a line on a graph from the flood, man's rate of life drops dramatically and then levels off into the place eventually where we are today. Now again, that changes with medical science back and forth, depending on how we can manipulate these, these shells and these bodies. But understand, there's a dramatic change in the longevity of man scripturally, after the flood in Genesis 6. Now, why would that be? Well, many scientists believe that this water canopy described here in Genesis chapter 1 being thick enough to hold 40 days worth of water in this gaseous vapor form surrounding the earth would have protected the earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation, cosmic rays, working in line with the earth's magnetic field to deflect these things as they came in. Virtually, you'd have lived on a planet without the, the effects of radiation. And we now know that radiation is a huge aging factor. And what that means is, is you could just like lay out in the sun all day and not get wrinkled. I mean, you just like on the slip and here you are. You know what I'm saying? It's just this constant thing going on where this canopy is protecting you from all the, all the harmful rays that are coming in from the outside. Now, again, I find that exciting because it goes right in line with what the scripture says God indeed did. Now, what would be some of the advantages for the earth? If there's this water canopy surrounding the earth, what are the advantages? Well, it's interesting. Scientists say that with a water canopy of vapor around the earth, here's some of the effects that it would have. See if this doesn't line up with Scripture. Water vapor would spread incoming solar radiation. That is the radiation itself as far as all the, danger, the dangerous rays would not make it. But the heat radiated would come inside through the gaseous vapor. And this heat would be held inside like a global greenhouse. And because the vapor circles the entire earth, as the warmth came in, the warmth would spread evenly around the earth and you would have one worldwide temperature all around the planet. Very, very warm. If you will, a paradise. What did God say? He created Adam and Eve and placed them where? In the Garden of Eden, 
referred to as a paradise. This, can you imagine? It'd be like just beautiful you know, weather all day long. Instead of sunny California or sunny Florida, it'd be sunny world. It would just always be that way. And because there was no rain yet, there would, you wouldn't have rainstorms. It would just be this constant beautiful weather all over the place. They also say with uniform temperatures, the great air mass movement would not take place, which means there wouldn't be any storms. You wouldn't have storms. And of course, we know there was no rain at that time. So again, that would explain that as well until later on at the flood, once this canopy was released. And there would be a daily evaporation and condensation, making rain unnecessary. In other words, it would create this moisture of a mist that would water the entire earth evenly without rain. Even as God's word says that it didn't rain until Genesis 6. And so again, you would have this warm, lush, green environment all over the world. And everywhere you live, it would be great. You wouldn't have to watch the Weather Channel to see what it's going to be like tomorrow or to see what it's going to be like over on this part of the world. Everybody would be 80. You know, everybody would be 78 or whatever your favorite temperature is. I'm not saying we could control that, but you get the point. Evenly spread, it would have had a lush vegetation all over the world, giving us a picture of what God says the Garden of Eden was like. Now, again, you see the world that we have today is nothing like it was when it was created. Sin has tainted and scarred it. Not just man, but the creation itself has been tainted and scarred. And so when Jesus returns, the Bible says he's going to restore the earth. Now think about it. When he comes back, I don't know. Is he going to put the canopy around the earth again? I don't know. But the Bible says he's going to restore the earth as it was to new when he returns. Now won't that be exciting? It's interesting, it talks about in Romans 8, verses 19 through 22, notice what it says about creation itself. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, that is for the Lord to come back. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that is it has hope after this, beyond because the Lord will restore it, but the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the entire creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So again, that's going to pass away. God's going to come back and restore all this. And again, you know, it's interesting when we read about the millennial kingdom, it says that people will once again to begin to live hundreds of years old. It tells us in Ezekiel that if someone dies at the age of 100 in the millennial kingdom, people are going to say, you know, they were young. They died as a child, they'll say. And so understand, when you talk about the way God designed us, let me just say this. When God designed your body, you know how long he designed it to live? Forever. If it wasn't for the decaying processes and the radiation processes and all that we now have in this world, God has created you fearfully and wonderfully. Your cells reproduce. You could actually reproduce enough to continue to live forever. But the reason that you can't now is because, again, sin is into the world and decay is into the world. God has removed this canopy as the earth was flooded in a worldwide flood. And now we have all the effects of that until the Lord comes back and restores it. And the Bible says when he restores it, we will once again live hundreds of years. And, of course, at that time, we'll have our new bodies, so we'll live eternally. But interesting, he goes on here now in verse 7, says, God made the firmament, divided the waters under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so... And God called the firmament heaven, and so the evening and the morning were the second day. So we come to the end of the second day. But notice this, as we come to the end of the second day, this firmament, this expanse between the earth and this body of water that used to be above us in this gaseous vapor form, he calls heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but in my mind, that's a lot different than heaven. Understand, he's not talking about the heaven we think of as the abode of God. The Bible speaks of three different heavens. The Bible says that from land up until our atmosphere is the first heaven. That is the one that we see created here where God is talking about where he separated the waters from the waters. The second heaven begins right there at the atmosphere and goes out into what we call outer space where all of the universe and the planets are. But the third heaven, the Bible says, is even beyond that and that is where God himself resides. Where do we see the third heaven in Scripture? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4, it says this, Paul sharing his vision that he had seen of heaven, he said, I know a man who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or whether out of body I do not know, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Again, this is that third heaven, that abode of God. And verse 4 says, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So again, don't be stumbled by the fact that he says that this was heaven and it was created because we're going to see as God continues on in his creation, we'll get into the actual second heaven that God created. And of course, the third heaven already existed. And really, God started with the third heaven, moved down to the first and then and the second in that order. So the creation of God and God's creative power, what a great God we have. 
what a great God we serve. How exciting it is to look at his word and to see God explain what he's done and why he's doing it. But I want to challenge us as we, as we finish these first couple of days of creation because notice here at the very beginning it says there in verse 2 that God's spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. Again, we talked about his spirit hovering over this form this, that was formless and void, this creation that he's made, hovering over it, getting ready to do a work. The question for us today is, are you like that? Are you form and void this morning? Are you one that has not yet given your life to the Lord? Do you find yourself without meaning, without purpose? Saying, why am I here? I feel so empty. I feel formless and void. I want you to know this morning, the Spirit of God is hovering over you right now. And the same Spirit that hovered over the creation and said, let there be, is the same Spirit that hovers over your heart this morning and says, you know what? If you will let me be in your heart, you will see that I will create in you a new creation. The Bible says if you receive Jesus Christ in your heart, you will become born again. And so God has that same creative power for you. But what you've got to do is you've got to say, all right, Lord, I accept it. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. I let you now create in me what you want me to be. And I give my life to you. But again, I want to say for us that are believers this morning, again, maybe you feel like in your walk right now, you're formless and void. (laughs) There's no real direction. You feel like you've kind of lost your way. And you're saying, God, I need you to touch me again. I need a fresh touch of your spirit this morning. Understand this, believer. The same power that was in the Spirit then is the same power that's here today. You can leave here now being touched again and being revitalized by God's Spirit, but you've got to ask Him to do it. Lord, touch me again. Don't just hover over me. Fill me afresh. Fill me anew that I can once again, Lord, know Your creative power in my life. Take this lump of clay and continue to mold and shape. So if you don't know the Lord, I encourage you, make that commitment this morning. Learn the creator who so loves you, the one that has formed you, but is waiting for you to know him. And if you're a believer and you're not really where you know you want to be this morning, ask for God to put his creative power once again to work in your life, his spirit to move again so that you can once again find God moving in a great way in your heart. God will be faithful to do it. Why don't we pray and ask for God to create that in us this morning? Let's pray. Lord, that is our desire this morning, that, Lord, you would create in us, even as the word says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Lord, I pray for those that may not even know you this morning, that for the first time they might know the creator in their heart. What an amazing thing to know that the one that created the heavens and the earth is not just one that is outside, but if we ask you into our heart, the very creator comes to live within us. Such power, such glory. Lord, we can't even grasp it, but we thank you for it. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here that don't know you, that right now they would say, I want to know you. Your light has shined on me. I see it. And now I want to receive it for my own. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and be my Savior. I give all to you. But Lord, this morning for the believers who need that fresh renewing of your spirit, even as David prayed, renew a right spirit within me. Lord, I pray that this morning you would renew a fresh spirit in our lives. Create in us a new heart that's once again soft and in love with you, Lord, that we might walk in your fullness again, recognizing and enjoying the God that we love and that we serve. And we bless you and we praise you and we ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Our time at the table of God's Word has come to a close for today. But what are some things you gained from what you heard? The book of Genesis gets the ball rolling, causing you to think about all kinds of big picture questions, things related to the creation of the world, why God would allow a worldwide flood, and why were the Israelites His chosen people? These are all good things to think about and to dig further in God's Word. But our hope is that what you heard today has helped solidify some things that might have been in question before. God was specific in how he brought things about. None of it was accidental or haphazard. As you listen through this series, we trust that you'll come to some great realizations about who God is and what he's done and is doing. To listen to this message again or share with a friend, go to thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net simply click on the Come to the Table tab. If you have some questions about what you heard today, we'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link on our website or call us at 865-609-4444. 
1385. That's 865 609 1385. Please don't hesitate to reach out. We encourage you to stay grounded in God's Word, allowing Jesus to grow you and draw you closer to Him daily, being willing to go where He's guiding you. Pastor Mark has prepared another teaching here in the book of Genesis. So join us again the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.